Right. You see, sir, if there is no God, what am I? I'm an accidental collection of atoms. Right. I am a monkey evolved to a higher order. And that's all you are, if there is no God. So for you and for me to talk about our value is absurd. Then you see me do something, and then you have to evaluate what you see. Uh -huh. But as a human, isn't sin an inherent part of me? But yet, through faith, I should be able to completely avoid sin, but it seems so unavoidable in this right. finite amount of time. I can avoid it sometimes, uh -huh. but all the time. Right. It's really confusing. Well, I have a simple type of mind, so I always try and simplify things, so here we go. Faith in America means, intellectually, I think Jesus is true. Intellectually, I think God exists. Jesus did never use the word faith in that sense. Faith, as Jesus used the word, referred to profound trust, profound loyalty, total commitment to him. So if I put my faith in Christ, it's going to be shown in the way I obey him as Lord. And often people ask me, well, Cliff, do you ever doubt? Or do you just have this incredible faith? And I have to look them in the face and say, of course I doubt. Every time I sin, it shows I doubt. You see, because when Jesus uses the word faith, he's not talking about intellectual gymnastics, where I get to the point where intellectually I think God exists. No, he's talking about a profound trust and loyalty in him that'll be shown in my ethics, in my morality. So of course I doubt. Every time I sin, it shows I do not take Jesus seriously. I think I got a better way of doing it, Jesus, so you just stay away and I'll do it my way, thank you. And that's true of every follower of Christ. Now obviously the challenge for me is to grow in my faith, to grow deeper, to grow stronger in my dependence upon Christ, which will be shown in obeying him, taking him seriously. There was a fourth century Asiatic monk named Telemachus. He lived in a monastery and his responsibilities were to tend the garden behind the monastery. One day he felt the Lord calling him to go to the great city of Rome, the hub of the known world of his day. He didn't know why, but in obedience he went. He walked into Rome, he went with the flow of the crowd into the ghettos, he went with the flow of the crowd into the Colosseum. And he began to realize that people were going to be entertained by gladiators fighting to the death. This little 4th century Asiatic monk, Telemachus, runs up and stands on the wall around the Colosseum and shouts out, In the name of Christ, stop! Well, nobody pays any attention to him. The gladiators continue to fight to the death. Little guy hops off the wall, runs down, hops into the middle, runs in between the two gladiators and says, in the name of Christ, stop. The crowd laughed at first. They thought he was part of the entertainment. But suddenly, one of the gladiators' vision was blocked by the guy, and he almost got hit by the other gladiator's sword. The crowd cried for the blood of the little monk. The gladiator hauled back and slashed Telemachus across the chest. He crumpled to the sand, and with his last gasp of breath, he cried out, in the name of Christ, stop. Silence settled over the Colosseum. One man stood up and walked out, a second, a third, a fourth, until the entire Colosseum was empty. That was the last time that people were allowed to fight to the death in the Colosseum. The lonely stand of that fourth century Asiatic monk brought to an abrupt halt. Gladiators fighting to the death for the entertainment of the crowd. Now obviously there were other forces at work politically, but that guy's lonely stand because of his faith in Christ, people stop slaughtering each other for the entertainment of the crowd. Led to his death, but he stood there because of his faith in Jesus Christ. That's what faith in Christ is like. There are ethical implications. It's not always easy, often it's difficult. I'm a coward. I don't like do it, taking those kind of stands. And that's when my faith falters, and I cave in to that which is expedient instead of that which is moral, that which is popular instead of that which is a little weird. 
And yet when my faith is in Christ, and it, as it grows and deepens, it produces a courage that enables us to do what is right instead of what is easy or expedient. But my thing is, how are we supposed to believe something that happened way back then? Like, if I'm going to school or whatever, and I'm thinking, well, it's physically impossible for anybody to raise from the dead. Because once you die, your physical disintegrate. So how is your physical going to come back to life? Great you question. Yes, sir, I, I, I'm with you. If there is no supernatural God, it is stupid to think that anybody rose from the dead. Because you're right. If there is no supernatural God, all of reality is matter and energy. Right. But you see, my point is, if there is a supernatural God, then this God who created life could certainly change some natural laws, perform a miracle. So, but don't it say in the Bible also that the dead know nothing? Psalms talk about that. So, if the dead know nothing, how do we know what comes after death? Good. The only way I'm going to know what comes after death is if there's a supernatural God who reveals to me that there's something after death. If there's no supernatural God, then obviously when we die, we rot. Right. And that's the whole story. But you see, if there's a supernatural God, then it's possible that there's life after death. But did man, okay, did man, did man make God or did God make man? Okay, great question. I think it's real clear that at times, man makes up God. You know what I'm talking about. God's a white man. That's why we white folks are superior to you black folks. That's a man-made God. That's a joke. That's God based on my own prejudices, my own racist attitudes. And that's going on too frequently. That's sick. That's evil. That's warped. That's idolatry. OK, and did. But, but wait a minute. But just because people do that, doesn't mean that in reality, there's not a supernatural God. Right. Right? Okay. So now the question becomes, what's the evidence that there is a supernatural God? And I would argue, the evidence that God exists is very similar to the evidence that you have a rational mind. See, I can't prove that you have a rational mind. But why am I convinced you have a rational mind? Because the way you dress yourself because the way you speak to me in articulate, orderly speech. That's why I'm convinced that between your two handsome ears, there's a rational mind. I can't prove God, but there's so much order in the creation, the human eye, central nervous system. There's got to be an intelligent mind behind it. Okay, so I got another question. Yes, sir. Um, my thing is, I look at it as man making good and evil. So therefore, my sins are different from everybody else's sins. See what I'm saying? Okay, good. Do you really believe that slavery in the United States was wrong because we human beings now think it was wrong? I mean, my thing basically with the Bible is it say that all men are brothers or whatever. whoop de whoop okay? And if I'm separating you, if I'm not looking at you as being me, then therefore I'm committing a sin against myself or yourself. You see what I'm saying? I hear you. But see, my question remains. Do you think that slavery is wrong just because we get together and say slavery is wrong? Or do you think that slavery is absolutely evil? I think it's absolutely evil. Thank you. So do I. OK, now, the only way there can be an absolute evil is if there is some type of God to create and define the value of justice. Right. There's got to be some type of God who gives you value, the same value he gives to me. But the thing is, I don't think everybody must, if you, if you think about it, everybody must see alike in order to be alike. So if I'm looking at you as being inferior to me, I'm going to put you down because you're not me. And the thing is, like I said, to me, the Bible is just about all me and our brothers. And how can we be brothers or whatever, whoop de whoop if I make slavery or some other, or money and put you down in poverty or anything, I'm right. separating myself from everybody else. So therefore, right. it's always, we're in this war and we born, we born in sin. We born, and we born in, with inequality. That's basically the main thing. We look at each other as being different when we were all alike in the first place. You see what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Okay, but you see, my point is this. 
all of what you've just said is based on there being a God. Right. Because you see, sir, if there is no God, what am I? I'm an accidental collection of atoms. Right. I am a monkey evolved to a higher order. And that's all you are, if there is no God. So for you and for me to talk about our value is absurd. We're accidents, if there is no God. But you see, if there is a God who's created you and me for a purpose, then you and I have value. Which means for me to dehumanize you through racism, through slavery, is absolutely evil. Right. Not evil because I'm an intelligent white Westerner and I say, oh man, racism's not cool. That's not why it's wrong. It's wrong because racism and slavery are a denigration, a devaluing of human beings who God has given an innate value to. That's why it's wrong, in an absolute sense. <laughs> See, you, come on, think with me. Those white slaveholders, they had reasons why they had slaves. Those slaves made them prosper financially. Right. It worked financially for them. Right. So they had good reason to maintain slavery. <coughs> And if morality is simply based on our reasons, boy, we are in a lot of trouble. <laughs> I'm standing here saying, we all know better than that. We know that slavery is wrong, not just because Americans took a vote and fought, fought a civil war. We know that it's wrong because slavery is a violation of the value and dignity of a human being who's created in the image of God. That's why it's wrong. And if the South would have won the civil war, that doesn't change the fact that slavery is wrong. In other words, because there's a God who has defined moral absolutes, morality doesn't come out of the barrel of a gun. Powerful, evil people can win, but that doesn't make them right. Yes, sir. I heard a pastor once say when he had a dilemma, he said that God spoke to him. Um, I don't think it's like an audible voice that he heard. Now, how do you know if God is actually speaking to you and trying to direct your life in a certain path? A very difficult question. And the reason it's so difficult, because obviously there have been some horrible abuses, right? David Koresh, God spoke to me. <coughs> Jimmy Jones, God spoke to me. Almost every single Christian cult is based on someone who says, God spoke to me, and this is what he said. That is why you better be very skeptical whenever anybody says to you, God spoke to me. And what you better do is you better listen hard to what they say, and then you better compare it to what Jesus said. And if it contradicts what Jesus said in any way, say, well, thank you, but no thanks. Second point. Yes, it is possible that God does speak to different individuals. How does he do that? He does that through his Holy Spirit. He does that by changing our desires, by giving us an urging, a leading in a certain direction. He does that by speaking to us through other people, through circumstances, I never once have audibly heard God's voice, but I believe that he has led me through changing my desires, changing my thought patterns. I believe that he has guided me that way. But you always have to be very, very careful whenever anybody says, well, God is leading me to do this. Ask him why. Why do you think that? A guy out here yesterday said, essentially, he said, I believe in God, but not in Jesus. I said, really, tell me what the God is like that you believe in. He said, oh, I believe that God loves me. I said, really? How did you find that out? He said, in here. I said, what do you mean, in here? He said, well, I got a feeling. God loves me. And I said, well, how do you know that's not just indigestion you're having over lunch? That feeling in here. See, you've got to be skeptical about just feelings that come over you. You've got to ask, where do these feelings come from? Who's really doing the talking here. Is it just my own selfishness? Is it some Satan or a demonic influence? Or is it really God speaking to me? You gotta be skeptical. You gotta ask yourself, why do I trust whatever it is or whoever it is I'm trusting? See, that's why I would plead with you. Read the Gospels. Get to know Jesus. And then if you have an urging in a particular direction and it's in an agreement with Jesus, go for it, friend. Go for it. But if it contradicts Jesus, Question it. Be skeptical. Uh, yes, Skinner raised the point that uh, Jesus was like the greatest behaviorist of all time, and that the, the greatest way to get to control someone is to make them love, and that Jesus was just 
a great behaviorist getting everyone to love and that it would really all contrive. <laughs> okay, to be, be honest with you, if there is no God, I agree with B.F. Skinner's behaviorism. If there is no God, he is not free to speak the way he does, I'm not free to speak the way I do. If there is no God, he's not free to smoke, and I'm not free not to smoke. It's all genetically determined. It's all biochemically determined. It's all determined by the influences of our environment. No, we have Skinner completely the opposite of that. It's all conditioned. Everything's been conditioned. It's not at all by a mind. Yeah, but there's no free will. There's no me that's free to make decisions. Well, there is, like, free will, but you think you're coming to a decision, but it's really an important Exactly. There is no free will. I might think I'm free, but I'm not. And I think B.F. Skinner's right. If there is no God. If there is no God, you don't love a woman. You have a sex drive, and that woman satisfies your sex drive. If there is no God, your mom and dad don't love you. They have a drive to preserve the genetic pool, and that's why they care for you. I think he's right. Because if there is no God, you reduce reality to matter and energy. That's what, all there is to reality. Now, my experience of life contradicts that. I know B.F. Skinner says I'm dreaming, but I disagree when I say, I am free to respect you or to be disrespectful. In fact, last night I sat on my bed. No, I didn't. I sat in the car going home with my buddies, the place we're staying. And I said, you remember that blonde-haired guy who was standing over there yesterday? Remember how intense I came on to him? That was really wrong of me. And if he's out here again today, I'm going to have to apologize to him. See, I am capable of self-reflection, self-judgment. So you think? I'm convinced. What do you think? I don't know. It's too, I, I've like thought about it too much. It's like too uh, complicated. I thought maybe you could sit every white on his bottle. All right, here. How's this? I walk up to him, smock, all back, and smack him in the face. I turn to you and say, man, I had to do it. Do you believe me? Thank you. There's plenty of people that were living and died before Jesus, so what? Does, does everyone say they, do you believe they went to hell or what? Or do you believe what? Difficult, excellent question. What about those people who never had the opportunity to hear about Jesus? Right, if he died for everyone's sins, you know? Great question. I do not know specifically how God will judge those who never heard about Jesus because Jesus never specifically answered the question. And obviously my knowledge is limited to what Jesus said. But Jesus makes five points that apply to your excellent question. First point, Jesus insisted that God's character is just. Because of that, nobody's getting ripped off. No one's going to be judged unfairly because God the judge is just. So they couldn't have went to hell then, if that's true. All right? Second point. Jesus insisted the only reason people go to hell is because they choose to live their life separate from God. In other words, no one's going to hell because they didn't hear about Jesus. No one's going to hell because of lack of information. Nobody. The only reason people go to hell is because they choose to live their life separate from God. And on the day of judgment, God will grant their request, and they'll spend eternity separate from him because that's what they asked for. Third point. In Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament... We have a partial list of people who will be in heaven who never heard the word Jesus. They lived hundreds of years before him. But these people in humility put their faith in God. God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm trusting you with my life. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Rahab, a Gentile prostitute are five examples of this. Fourth point. The only reason Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Rahab, the Gentile prostitute, are going to be in heaven is because Jesus bled and died on a cross. In other words, Jesus insisted no one's going to be in heaven because they lived a goody-goody life. Because none of us have lived a goody-goody life as God defines good. We all need God's forgiveness, and that's what Christ offers through his death on the cross. Fifthly and finally, Although I specifically don't know how God is going to judge those who've never heard about Christ, I do know that all of us here have more than ample opportunity to read the Gospels, to investigate Jesus. You and I are responsible for what we do with Jesus. Right, I was going to say he does, fault some of, he does fault some people for not 
trying to find out about him, Correct. isn't he? Okay. It's a great point. I am always confronted by people who say to me, well, Cliff, I just don't know. I just, I just can't put my faith in Christ yet. Maybe someday. And I like to tell them, well, it's like this. Romeo asks Juliet, would you marry me? And Juliet says, no, Romeo, not today. I'm, I'm just not sure. The next day, Romeo says, Juliet, I really love you. Would you marry me? Juliet says, no, Romeo, I'm not sure. I, I just don't know. And next week, Romeo says, Juliet, I really love you. Would you marry me? And Juliet says, no, Romeo, I, you know, I don't know. Well, if Juliet keeps on responding that way to Romeo, they're both going to die without ever having gotten married. And the same is true between Jesus Christ and me as an individual. I can say, well, I'm agnostic. I, I really don't know. But that is a decision that I'm making, a decision not to respond to Christ's love. So Christ says, watch out. Don't play games with me. I have not played games with you. I have displayed my love and trustworthiness very clearly by bleeding and dying on a cross, by rising from the dead. So don't get caught in agnosticism. Well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Look at the evidence, make a decision based on the evidence, trust Christ. Or if the evidence is he's not reliable, reject him and put your faith in someone who's more reliable than Jesus. But for the life of me, I can't find anybody who's more reliable than Jesus. Me either. <laughs> yes, sir. I've always learned that, you know, God helps those who help themselves. Where do you draw the line between self-sufficiency and giving yourself over, you know, unconditionally? Great question. God helps those who help themselves. That's not the Bible. Is that Ben Franklin? <laughs> Could be. Someone like that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Great question. Ted Turner has said very clearly, Christianity is for losers. Christianity is a crutch. And the clear implication is, I'm a self-made man. I'm going to go out and do it and make it happen. Ted Turner has a false understanding of faith in Christ. Faith in Christ is not an excuse to be a wimp. Faith in Christ is not a license to be lazy. Faith in Christ is not a license to be irresponsible. Faith in Christ means I understand that everything that I have is a gift from God. God has put me in a position of responsibility. I am to use the gifts that he has given me to make this present world more like heaven will be. Dr. Martin Luther King had a vision of heaven. He understood this world is a messed up world. I want to make this world more like heaven will be. That's good faith. Mother Teresa, deep faith in Christ, saw the destitute in Calcutta, India, the dying. She understood what heaven would be like, and she busted to make sure that she did everything within her power to make this messed up, unfair, cruel world more like heaven will be. That is good faith in Christ. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells a fascinating parable. It's a parable about those who have genuinely put their faith in Christ. Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse 14, Jesus says, Again it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. We're not all born equal. We have different talents, different abilities. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who received the one talent came. 
Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and gathering what you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Gosh, what's he saying? It's crystal clear. God has given you and me talents. He's put us in a position of responsibility to use those talents. And when Christ returns a second time, he will hold us accountable for how we use those talents. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching this episode. Hit that subscribe button. We love for you to join the family. Also, want to invite you to our church in New Canaan, Connecticut. It's New Canaan High School and it meets Sundays at 9.30 a.m.